So anyway, I'm Dave Todd. I've been working on Buffer Bloat for about uh, two and a half years now. Others have been working on it for about 30. Um, I'm assuming at this point that almost everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about when I mention Buffer Bloat. Show of hands. Very cool. And the rest of you aren't paying attention. <laughs> oh, that hurt. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to keep the usual buffer bloat intro really short. It's this is something that we've been managed to inject into almost all of our networks, very, very, very long pipelines between the application and the devices <coughs> themselves. So as we've added more and more bandwidth, we've added bigger and bigger pipelines. And when those pipelines fill up, really bad things happen. Uh, I have a standard slide here which shows uh, 82 seconds of extra buffering in a system built on a train. Does anybody think that 82 seconds is a little excessive? Yeah. But what we're typically seeing in the field is uh, delays measured in seconds or tens of seconds uh, once you use TCP to fill up a link. There was a study that kicked off the entire buffer bullet effort from ICSI, uh, which is this one on the bottom right hand side of my slides, which shows that <coughs> end users under load were experiencing anywhere between, on, on average, over half a second of latency. Um, and some were experiencing as many as four seconds. And the interesting thing about this particular study is that the reason why we don't know if anyone was experiencing latencies longer than four seconds is that the test did not run that long. <laughs> so uh, Jim Geddes and I and about 400 volunteers got together and tried to figure out uh, why queue lengths have become so long. Um, still, though, put this in perspective, uh, this is one uh, time from Earth to the Moon four times in the last three feet of your internet connection, uh, which seems to be a little bit silly. The thing is, um, when I was here last, I was talking about a thing called SFQ Red, uh, which was a combination of fl a flow queuing technology and an older queue management technology called Red, which about four months later, Van Jacobson and his wife Kathy Nichols came out with a replacement for called Coddle. And about a week after that came out, uh, Eric Dumuzet and I combined that with the same flow queuing techniques that we were using in SFQ Red with Coddle. And it uh, won so massively that we've had to write new tests to be able to determine differences in the software versus what we used to have versus what we have now. Um, it's reached the point where it's no longer even worth talking about the old style of queue management, according to Andrew McGregor. And, uh, huge number of people at the IETF. So one of the new tests we've written is a thing called Rule, which is the real-time response under load test. I'll get to that in a minute. We also spent the last nine months or so since uh, developing this technology, proving that it would actually work and proving that it, might, that it won't fail and proving that it was better than anything that ever existed. So the core two innovations are a technology called flow queuing. Is everyone familiar, everyone familiar with DRR or stoastic fair queuing? Ah, so I got to do that one. So web pages, for example, consist of dozens to hundreds of flows, dozens to hundreds of DNS uh, queries, dozens to hundreds of things like ARP and various and sundry other small packets. And the way that we were conventionally doing it before was that we would stuff them all into one vertical queue. Even though you might only have one DNS packet and a gigantic flow of TCP, there's another DNS packet. What Stoastic Fair Queuing or DRR do is that they say, well, I'm going to deliver one packet from this flow, 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 one packet from this flow. And that means that all of your shorter flows bubble up to the top and are delivered much more rapidly. So this works especially well in gaming, VoIP, DNS, and so on traffic. The only kinds of traffic it does not uh, do much for, or actually uh, degrades slightly, is elephant flows, the really, really big flows. But those are the ones causing the problem. So uh, finding a way of scaling up SFQ is what, spent mo what Eric and I spent most of the last two years working on. Uh, we finally came up with a system, he did mostly, uh, come up with a system that would scale all the way up past 10 gig E, well past 10 gig E on modern hardware. And as I mentioned, <laughs> Kathy Nichols and Van Jacobson came up with a, sy a system that once you could identify your biggest, fattest flows, that would just tap them, shoot them just a little bit 
to get TCP to ramp down to where it only had typically 5 ms worth of induced delay on the link. So, Cable Labs uh, spent, uh, Greg, White, Greg White over at um, Cable Labs spent a great deal of time over the last few months uh, mm. developing an extensive set of simulations of real traffic, people doing uploads and downloads, web traffic, gaming traffic, and so on, and benchmarked all the available algorithms. Now this is a CDF plot which shows the probability of a given um, uh, gaming traffic, uh, in this case being delayed by X amount, uh, at a 50% probability in a drop tail queue on an on a emulated cable modem, we saw over a second worth of induced latency, which reduces a game to unusability. And there was an alternate solution called a buffer control for cable modems. It did better. And then there's two competing uh, algorithms. There's Cottle and then there's Cisco is proposing Pi. Uh, and those did pretty well. And then SFQ Cottle outperformed all of them by about an order of magnitude, all the way up to the 90th percentile, to where we saw nearly zero latency introduced on heavily mixed traffic, all the way up to the 90th percentile. <coughs> Similarly, web traffic, which is actually very highly interactive, we would see under the kinds of loads simulated in this particular study, uh, web pages take up to 14 seconds to load at the 50th percentile. Um, and with SFQ Cottle, it was almost completely unnoticeable. Almost any level of traffic. At the highest level of the curve, above 9, uh, uh, probability of 9, we had things like 32 plus uh, bit torrent streams going simultaneously. And uh, it's just cut right through the bit torrent traffic and worked brilliantly. Now, people don't necessarily, uh, can I actually click on that and have a video come up? Or would that be bad? All right. So um, static plots just don't do it. So we put together a demo of, at IATF of this technology actually running on an open WRT based router. And I'm going to waste about a minute of your time finding the right spot here. All right. So nobody can hear that, though. Is there no volume output in this thing? So I will talk. Coddle algorithm. Um, one without with just the C. Here is this is the one. Okay. So what we did is we set up in the left hand side um, a the web Chrome uh, sorry the Chrome web page benchmark, and on the left hand side we had FQ Coddle running, and on the right hand side we didn't, and we just told it to load the top ten websites. And if you can see on your screens there, during a major one single upload and one download. On the right hand side, we're seeing what typical users experience when they do a big upload or a download <coughs> today. We circulate all the way through all 20 uh, website URLs that I had here before it even gets to the fifth one on the other one. It's much more exciting with the vocals. <laughs> <coughs> Moving on. Um, I seem to have lost my cursor. Oh, a remote control person. Oh, there we go. Uh, these technologies apply to almost every technology we've been able to get our hands deeply into. Uh, this is a uh, real-world ADSL modem with hardware flow control. On the, uh, my left hand side is what it was like before FQ Cottle was applied to it. It was experiencing 1.2 seconds of latency under this load. And then it's down to two, uh, roughly 24 ms worth of induced latency. So uh, once we started getting things uh, improved by a factor of 20 to 50, we needed to develop some new tests. And I had a bugaboo of mine in that most of our speed and bandwidth tests don't test the actual protocol we use on the internet, on the otherwise known as TCP. And they usually test one upload, that's your upload, and one download, and that's your download, and then a ping, and that's your ping. They never test them simultaneously, uh, which is obviously how we always use our networks. We always just do an upload, right, of UDP. So we developed a new test called the real-time response under load test, which exercises TCP, which exercises classification, 
and which tries various and sundry other techniques to measure your upload speed and your download speed and your uh, latency all at the same time. And it pretty much will break almost every network on the planet. <laughs> um, so I've been showing off the graphs that we get from this in the hope that this becomes a useful diagnostic tool for not only for your users testing your network, but for you testing products from your vendors. So on the right hand side of this particular test is best effort, background, CS5, which is the standard video marketing marking, and EF, which is for voice. And this particular link was rated for 20 megabits down. And it never achieved that due to all the contention on the link. Your classic TCP sawtooth exchange size on this incredibly long 30 second period. So congestion avoidance, if you look at the bottommost graph, is really harmed by having extreme amounts of latency on your link. The middle graph shows uh, TCP running away on a given flow and the other flow suffering because of it. Again, because introduced by the incredibly long latencies on this link, which are actually pretty low for a cable modem. A few seconds later, I applied FQ Coddle with a rate limiter. And I immediately was able to achieve the full down rated download link on this particular cable modem. Um, this particular shaper has a three-tier setup, so I'm able to do some classification and was able to, again, achieve full upload capacity. In this case, it was 8 megabits up, 20 megabits down. And simultaneously, you still hold the latencies down for game, uh, video, sorry, for game and sparse traffic um, like DNS, down below 10 MS increase on average. <coughs> um, the same techniques apply on Wi-Fi. It is the first AQM that is capable of dealing with the variable sh uh, bandwidth shaping that is available in Wi-Fi. Uh, this was a test I did last week on OpenWRT on a single point-to-point uh, -point Wi-Fi link. Saw it introduce a grand total of 12 MS worth of latency. Varies a little bit. And lastly, using the rule test, um, it makes it possible to look at what other kinds of traffic are doing to your link while you're saturating it so much. So I hit it this time with uh, 10 uh, hits on the um, 163.com website. Don't go there. It takes like 16 seconds to load. It's one of the most incredibly sharded, crazy websites there's out there. Um, but it shows that we just cleared enough room um, in the total amount of bandwidth being used by uh, your link to download the web page and then have your other flows resume full rate while still holding latencies remarkably low. Um, we've given away the code for the rule test. Uh, it can be easily installed in multiple versions of Linux. I strongly encourage people to try it on your links. We've tried it on switches. Uh, we've seen it's also uh, showing up interesting stuff on virtual machines. And uh, that's a link for it. So a lot of people, after Van and Kathy published their paper on Cottle, said, aha, that's what Van and Kathy think is the answer. Well, no, it was part of the answer. Uh, it is a unique way of managing multiple flows uh, that are TCP friendly. And once we got FQ Cottle working, Van uh, publicly uh, wrote the above which is that FQCOTL <laughs> provides great isolation. What I mean by that is that even if you have someone doing a ping flood or an attack or something like that against your link, it becomes just part of the background <coughs> noise. Almost all of your other flows run through on an unheated. IW10 problems can go away. And almost any kind of big flow can change, although I have one thing at the end of this talk uh, to talk to. So, as of last week, FQ Coddle is now the default on all interfaces in the OpenWRT distribution. It's in IP Fire. It's been in the Linux kernel since August, and then we are working towards making it the standard and the default in Linux over the next six months. Uh, Google's doing some interesting stuff. Early trials in Android have been very positive. Um, however, one of the core, well, I'll get there in a second. Uh, there's some BSD work happening. And uh, it's been under evaluation in cable labs. And uh, after seeing the numbers that were, I showed you earlier, uh, the IETF, well, there was a scene where basically the Googlers were going up to the uh, cable labs. People saying, when can we have this? When can we have this? 
because it may not be clear that it's not bandwidth that drives web transactions, it's round trip time. Above about five megabits of bandwidth, there's almost nothing you can do to improve the speed of a web page, except reduce the round trip time. What we've done is we've reduced that to the bare minimum, it has tremendous effects. So, uh, also immediately after that meeting at the IATF, Fred Baker obsoleted RFC, I think it's 2309, used to be known as the Red Manifesto, and we were working on replacing that with something derived from these technologies to become an internet standard. So, where can this stuff get deployed? Well, uh, almost everywhere. It's got almost no parameters, there's no need to twiddle with it, you just turn it on, leave it on. Um, in particular though, on anything that is an edge network where you go from a fast speed, say one, 10 megabits, down to one megabit, absolutely put this there on your rate limiter um, to help moderate the uh, biggest flows to keep latencies low. Uh, as I mentioned, virtual machines, I've seen 60 to 180 um, milliseconds of latency induced on many virtual machine implementations that can be completely eliminated. Now that's over, that's half a, half a round trip around the planet. So, yeah, might as well do it. Load balancers are useful. And almost anything that's highly interactive can be used with this stuff. Um, I keep getting dinged um, that, do I care about the core? The core has to run really, really, really fast and is most of the time is over-provisioned anyway. Uh, so, the algorithms do have some overhead and I don't really care. It's the users, the 2.4 billion people out there on the edges of the internet that can all benefit from this. Had people ask me about this, uh, Dan and Kathy and myself and Eric put all this stuff in the public domain and out under the BSD and GPL licenses. Uh, the NS2 code is all under the available under the BSD license, so feel free to go look. Uh, NS3 is under GPL, so put under GPL. Uh, the Linux code is GPL dual license, GPL BSD. So please go forth, test and deploy. The biggest challenge that we have is that although we've been able to retrofit these algorithms into a bunch of um, uh, very open hardware, such as uh, the stuff built around the Atheris chipsets, um, getting our fingers into the DSL modems and DSLAMs and CMTSs is a bit more difficult. So if you see this technology proving out, it would be helpful if you were to push your vendors to implement them in those as well. Unless they already run Linux, in which case you just turn it on. There's still research ongoing. Uh, we would like to completely replace the existing uh, queue management system in, in Linux. Uh, there's just a few tweaks left, uh, might happen in a week or two, might happen in a month or two, don't know. Uh, it turned out that the biggest overhead in the system was not, not the FQ, FQ portion or the CODL portion of the algorithm, but in the software rate limiters. So when we tried to scale up to thousands of users on HTB, uh, we got limited by that rather than the underlying stuff. <coughs> there is uh, work happening at Cisco um, called Pi. Uh, it has not been fully evaluated yet, and they're working on a flow queuing version. And uh, it may be possible to improve things by a few more percentage points here and there, so we keep playing with it. And uh, the reason why I'm on tour this past couple weeks is to convince people to try it and then deploy it. Um, and there's a few problematic protocols. Um, BitTorrent is still kind of difficult to deal with, and there's this thing called Dash, which I decided to put on here because my next, the next speaker is going to be talking about that. Uh, this is a sample of Dash traffic. What happens with Dash is about every one-tenth of every ten seconds, uh, you go out and you pull down the biggest part of video file you possibly can from a server that's usually co-located with your ISP so that the amount of bandwidth used ramps up really fast and then it stops huh? and it stops and you see latencies induced on your link uh, measured in tens of MS just from that one kind of traffic. Now this is a really compelling argument for putting something like SFQ or FQ call on the DSLAM or on the cable head end because it'll break up these bursts into something that's completely transparent. But at the same time, I would like to see these protocols made a little bit nicer on the overall quality of your link. Uh, the buffer bloat effort was all volunteers. Uh, 
from all over the world. I was really impressed uh, by all the people that jumped up to help out. Uh, one of them's here today, Robert Bradley, right there. Um, he, uh, we were experiencing trouble with IPv6, and oh man, the algorithm's broken with IPv6, we don't know. Well, it turned out that the hardware was having an instruction trap and just blowing up for sometimes seconds at a time. Um, under certain kinds of load, which just completely blew up our statistics until he managed to find and fix that for us. Simon Kelly is also here. There's some um, really great people that have helped out. And uh, this is a plot of where most people are today, experiencing up to a second of latency. And if you can implement this stuff on your edge networks, you could be down experiencing tens of MS. Questions? I'm sorry, my voice is going. Just, sorry, Neil. Neil, Neil McCray from BT. Sorry, I'm just. Uh, have you done any testing on DSL technologies with this at all? Yes. And, and same results. Um, there's two two interesting results. The first one is is that it appears that places like France Telecom implemented their own stochastic fair queuing uh, um, algorithm about seven or eight years ago on much of their equipment. So they are not suffering from buffer bloat anywhere near as bad. Um, as the rest of the universe. However, I believe this algorithm uh, performs uh, what they've implemented by a significant amount. Uh, the second one is, is that this stuff has to move in very, very, very close to the hardware. Uh, and, and the closer you can get to having all the buffering in a system controlled by this algorithm, the much better off you are. And it turns out that much of the DSL device have these binary blobs at the last stage that have an unknown or sometimes excessive amount of buffering. So although we've been able to get reasonable results from a few DSL devices, uh, it's that last couple, do last dozen or so buffers that have been embedded in the firmware that we can't currently fix. Saw somebody over there. Hi, uh, yes, um, Andrew uh, Lemon from Brandwatch. How have you found this compared to uh, HFSC? Um, could you speak up a little bit, sorry? How, how have you found the, uh, your CODAL algorithm compared to uh, HFFC? Um, we have, you can use this in combination with HFSC as well. Um, it does better than HFSC because it does a much better job of controlling queue length as well as uh, mixing up packets. Uh, have you tested and compared them comparatively? It is currently, if you want to do, the code's out there, man. Go forth and test. <laughs> it's free. Come Jeez, on. Um, it is in the current OpenWRT QoS system that uses a combination of HFSC plus FQCODL. Um, so go forth and Great, play. Thank you. Good. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. Thank you.